Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I welcome you to today's lecture. Um, this is the second week, and today's uh, topic is the rise of nationalism in Africa. And these are our study objectives. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to explain what African nationalism is and then identify the external and the internal factors that contributed to the rise of nationalism in Africa. So let's go right into the lecture for today. We are going to begin with the definition of what African nationalism is. So the question is, what is African nationalism? According to the scholar Neuberger in the year 1985, he indicates that African nationalism refers to the desire of Africans to unite themselves as a single nation and demand to liberate themselves from colonial rule, to be able to rule themselves. It could also be referred to as a political movement for pan-Africanism and for national self-determination. So it, it basically means that when we talk about African nationalism, it is the desire or the interest for Africans to unite and to fight for political freedom from their colonial masters. When the Europeans um, invaded the continent of Africa, they took control of many African countries, ruled them, and then exploited their natural resources to build their own countries. So by the year 1914, most African countries were dominated or controlled by the European countries. So it means that by the year 1914, most African countries were under colonialism. The only two countries who at this time were not colonized were the Abyssinia, which is present day Ethiopia, and then the West Coast states of Liberia. So apart from Abyssinia and then the West Coast of Liberia, all African countries, all other African countries were colonized by the European colonial masters. However, most African countries by the year 1970 had fought for their political freedom and to liberate themselves from their colonial masters. And a number of factors contributed to this. So our next topic is that we are going to look at the factors that contributed to the rise of nationalism in Africa. We are going to look at it from two perspectives. We are first going to look at the internal factors, and then we also look at the external factors. When we talk about the internal factors, we are referring to the things that happened within the continent of Africa that caused the African people to rise against their colonial masters and to fight for their political freedom. The first internal factor we are going to talk about is colonial education. In last, uh, in last week's lecture, we indicated that when the Europeans came to Africa, they introduced a new system of education to the African people. And this system of education, although it was um, European centrist, sought to educate the African. So with this education, the result was that there were a lot of Africans who were educated. Some of them became political activists, some became scholars, some became early. So there was a lot of elite people within the African society. These African um, elites or these African educated people became exposed to life outside the African continent. And then they got to know how unfair the European masters were treating their own people. And this caused them to mobilize their people and to fight for political independence. Examples of such scholars include Nelson Mandela of South Africa, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and a whole host of other, other uh, African uh, scholars. The next factor we are going to look at is the influx of European settlers in different parts of Africa. Now, what this means is that Apart from the colonial masters, the administrators and the governors who were actually in the business of colonizing the African people, a whole lot of Europeans also came to settle in Africa. When these European settlers came in, they took control of the fertile lands of the African people. 
leaving the non-fertile lands for the Africans themselves. So the people were living on their lands and the Africans living on their own lands were not getting access to the best parts of the lands. Some of them were driven out of their own farmlands. Some of them were driven out of their places of residence, leaving them in, in, in a state of displacement. Countries where this practice was very dominant include Zimbabwe and South Africa. So you had a whole lot of the Zimbabwe and South African lands being taken over by the European settlers. This made the African people unhappy, very angry, and this encouraged them to fight for their political freedom and to reclaim their lands from the European settlers. The next um, factor is the introduction of unfair colonial economic policies. Yes, before the coming of Europeans to Africa, Africans had their own economic policies. They had their own system of governance. But when the Europeans took over, they took total control of the affairs of the African people. This led to the introduction of uh, heavy and huge taxes. So the African people, after working, had to pay taxes to their European masters. Some of them were forced to work without being remunerated. Others were also forced to work in certain areas that they were not happy with. Some of them were forced to grow certain kinds of cash crops that the Europeans could export to uh, other European countries and to make money for themselves at the expense of the African people. All these policies that were put in place or introduced by the Europeans caused disaffection among the African people, leading to uh, a lot of resistance, tensions, and wars, which caused the African people to fight against their European uh, colonial masters and to gain their political freedom. The next factor, the fourth factor to be discussed is the influence of Liberia and Ethiopia. I have earlier indicated in this lecture that Ethiopia and Liberia were the only two African countries which were not colonized by the Europeans. So this served as a form of encouragement for the African countries that were being colonized. I mean, if Liberia and Ethiopia, who are African countries, can be independent on the African continent, then why can't the other African countries who are being colonized also gain their freedom from their colonial masters? So this uh, encouraged the African countries who were being colonized to fight for their freedom from their colonial masters. The fifth uh, factor... To, to be discussed is the introduction of foreign system of government. Before the introduction of, uh, before the coming of Europeans to Africa, Africans had their own political system. This political system consisted of chiefs who were in total control of their communities. There were a council of elders, there were uh, sub chiefs. At the family level, there were lineage heads, there were family heads who were in control of the administration of their African communities and ethnic groups. But when the Europeans took over the African countries, all of these systems broke down and then they established their own system of government. So there was an introduction of the presidential system of governments, the parliamentary system of governments, where people were, they now instituted clerks and then um, district chief executives in place of the chiefs. So some chiefs and rulers lost their political power and control over their own people to the, the new people that were instituted by these Europeans. And this caused a lot of disaffection among African rulers and the African people. So there were a lot of resistance from the parts of the African rulers and their people leading to the rise of nationalism in Africa and the fights for political freedom. The sixth one is the role of ex-soldiers. It is important to note that during the Second World War, which was largely engaged by the Europeans, the European countries who had colonial territories, 
recruited some of these Africans into their military to fight for them. So when some of these uh, Africans were recruited into the military and they went to the war front, they were taught how to fight. They were taught how to handle guns and how to handle other weapons. So when they came back from the war, that is at the end of the Second World War, some of these ex-soldiers had gained a lot of paramilitary experience. And so they, they, um, they taught their people how to fight physically and taught them how to use weapons that were made by the Europeans. And this encouraged the African people to fight for their independence. Because before the these Africans were introduced into the military of the Europeans, the Africans did not know how to handle guns. They were fighting with uh, swords and spears and cutlasses, which were less powerful than the guns and the bombs that were introduced by the Europeans. So when people were, the Africans, some of these Africans were trained, they were able to retrain their people who became well equipped to fight against their colonial masters. The next one is the influence of the media, yes. Newspaper publications also played very significant role in the African people's fight for their freedom. These newspaper publications were operated by the African scholars who were educated. So these scholars were able to write about happenings in Africa to be known by people outside the continent of Africa. And this put a lot of pressure on the colonial masters to grants uh, political freedom to their colonial territories. The next one, which is the last uh, factor and the last internal factor is improved transport network and urbanization. The coming of the Europeans led to the establishment of um, transportation system, well, if, and other forms of infrastructures. So this transportation system encourage people to move from their um, villages into the towns in search of better working and living conditions. So you had a whole lot of people from different ethnic backgrounds coming to meet and work in the urban areas. And these people shared their experiences. So through their shared experiences, they realized that they were all going through the same kind of difficulties. And these same kind of difficulties included racial discrimination, unemployment, and poor living conditions. So these different people from different ethnic backgrounds, joined by their common poor living conditions, their common problem of racial discrimination, and the common problem of unemployment, joined forces together, formed pressure groups and movements to fight against their colonial masters and to regain their political freedom. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the discussion of the internal factors that led to the rise of nationalism. Let's move on to the external factors that also supplemented the internal factors leading to the fight for independence in Africa. The first one, is the role and influence of the United States of Africa. During the Second World War, the United States of Africa were not involved in the war. Rather, it was the European countries who were largely involved in the war. Because of that, there were no destruction of the industries and the infrastructures in the United States of America. So after the Second World War, they emerged as one of the powerful countries in the world. Again, another reason why the USA emerged as a powerful force or a superpower is that during the Second World War, they were supplying ammunition and weapons to the European countries. So they gained a lot of money or let's say fortunes from this business uh, they were doing with the European countries. 
And thirdly, because the European countries were involved in the Second World War, they had exhausted a lot of their resources, their financial resources, their economic resources. And so most of their economies were crumbling. Because of that, they were not much in control of their economies. So the USA becoming a very powerful force took control of most of these economy, most of these colonial territories and supplied them with resources to fight for their uh, political freedom. The second factor is the role and influence of the United Nations. So the United, the United Nations puts so much pressure on colonial masters to grant freedom to their colonial territories. And this was done through the establishment of the Trusteeship Council. Under the Trusteeship Council, there were countries who were regarded as trustee territories. And some of these countries included Ghana, Rwanda, Burundi, Cameroon, and Tanganyika, among others. So countries who came under the trustee territories were granted support from the United Nations and this support encouraged them to fight for their freedom. The United Nations Trusteeship Council also put so much pressure on colonial masters to grant freedom to their colonial territories. An example is the pressure that was mounted by the United Nations on Britain to grant political freedom to Uganda, Kenya, and then Tanganyika. The third external factor is the effects of the Second World War. It has earlier been indicated that after the Second World War, most European economies had crumpled. And so they put so much pressure on their colonial uh, territories. So they made them work more than they usually did in order to gain more resources from these colonial uh, these colonial territories to rebuild their economies this pressure that was put by the colonial masters put the the colonized countries into so much difficulties that they had to rebel against their colonial masters again when the ex-soldiers returned from the Second World War, they also realized that the Europeans were no special human beings than themselves. Because at the war front, they realized that when an African is shot and he dies from his gun wounds, the European equally dies from his gun wounds. This meant that the Europeans were not superhuman than the the, Euro the Africans had earlier um, imagined, and this encouraged them to fight for their own independence from their colonial masters. The next um, factor is the 1955 Bandan Conference. This conference took place from the 18th to 24th April in the year 1955. It consisted of 22 Asian countries and seven African countries. The leaders of these countries came together with one agenda, and the agenda was to fight against colonial, colonial rule or colonialism. So at the end of this conference, um, these uh, African countries were more energized to fight not only for the freedom of their own countries, but to fight for the, for the freedom of other countries that were under colonial rule. The next one, the fifth one, is the Atlantic Charter of 1941. This Atlantic Charter was written by the then British Prime Minister, who was called Winston Churchill and the United States of America President Franklin Roosevelt. In this charter, these leaders called for respect for people's rights to choose their own government at their own will. And for this reason, there was a lot of pressure on colonial masters to grant freedom to their colonial territories, to choose their own governments and their own rulers. The next one, which is the seas, 
X factor is the role of Pan-African movement. So when we talk about Pan-African movement or Pan-Africanism, it is basically a philosophy that is based on the belief that Africans all over the world share common bonds, common objectives, and common interests. This uh, Pan-Africanism idea originated, first originated in the United States of America and was... Um, it was originated by the Black African as a movement against racial discrimination, against slavery, and against all forms of other injustice that were geared towards the African people. This um, Pan-Africanism idea was then extended into the African continent in the mid 20th century. So this also gave Africans the motivation that we need to come together, not just as individual African people in different African countries, but as an African continent to fight for the total liberation of all Africans on the African continent. So from this viewpoint, we can talk about two forms of Pan-Africanism. We can first talk about the continental Pan-Africanism and the diaspora pan-Africanism. The continental pan-Africanism is the kind of pan-Africanism that advocated for the unity of African states and peoples within the African continent to achieve a specific goal. Whilst the diaspora pan-Africanism relates to the unity of all Africans and black people outside the African continent for, to come together to work and achieve the political freedom of the African continent. We are going to look at the last part of our lecture. And um, the last part has to do with the emergence of economic interest groups. We have earlier indicated that the rise of nationalism occurred after the Second World War. And this is because after the Second World War, there was a lot of difficulties that the African countries were facing. They were faced with high taxes. They were faced with lack of jobs. They were faced with high inflation. So this led to the emergence of economic interest groups with the aim of fighting for better living conditions for their members. Some of these groups included traditional chiefs and then rulers. So these traditional chiefs and rulers were advocating for their own independence so that they could get control over their, their, their ethnic groups and to be able to rule them the way they did before the coming of Europeans. There were also small professional groups that consisted of doctors, and lawyers they were also they also worked hand in hand with successful merchants as businessmen and contractors these professionals one can say were a group of people who were economically privileged to some extent because of the kind of work they were doing nonetheless they were not just looking at their own interest and their own satisfaction, but they realized that the greater number of African people were in hard or harsh economic situations. And so they also came together to fight for the other people. There were also a group of people or an interest group that consisted mainly of primary school teachers and clerks and other small businessmen. And these uh, group were people who were actually look who were actually aiming at taking over the the role and then the positions of the colonial elites once the colonial masters exited their countries. There were also the urban workforce who also formed trade unions with the aim of uh, fighting for better working conditions and better living uh, services for their members.
So there was also a large informal sector in the urban areas, and this consisted of uh, females who were engaged in petty trading and business and small businesses. They were the market women who had erected stalls on pavements. They were the people who were who had small uh, businesses that they were operating in the marketplaces in the urban centers. There were also a community of farmers who were largely engaged in cash crop farming. So these were the people who were engaged in the cultivation of crops like cocoa, share butter, coffee, and the rest for exportation purposes. These uh, farmers who were engaged in cash crop farming formed farmers associations to demand for better working conditions for their people. Apart from the farmers who were in cash crop farming, there were also peasant farmers whose aim was to grow crops to feed the African people, to feed themselves and the other people in their community. They also formed uh, farming associations to fight against certain colonial policies that were not in favor of their work. So some of the policies that were introduced rather worked more for the farmers who were doing cash crop farming as against the farmers who were doing peasant farming. So the peasant farmers also formed associations whose aim was to fight for their rights and to fight against policies that worked against them. So this brings us to the end of today's lecture. Today we have looked at what African nationalism is, and then we looked at the external and then the internal factors that contributed to the rise of nationalism in Africa. We also concluded with the emergence of certain economic interest groups that came up to fight for the rights of their workers and their members during the period of nationalism. Thank you very much for watching, and then we will meet next week for our next lecture.